Um, I want to thank the uh, organizing committee for their hard work in making this conference possible. And it's my pleasure today to present to you my talk uh, titled Capsid Assembly Modifiers, Stabilize Hexameric Lattices While Destabilizing Native Icosahedral Symmetry. And a lot of the work in the Slotnik lab um, has historically focused on small molecule drugs that target the core protein of hepatitis B virus. Um, and this begs the question of why we would want to target the core protein. And the reason for that is that HBV core protein participates in nearly every step of the viral life cycle. When the virus enters the cell, um, the core protein, which makes up the capsid, trans, uh, basically uh, transports the viral genome to um, the nuclear pore where it disassembles. Um, and, then, uh, and then once the pregenomic RNA has been synthesized, um, 120 subunits uh, of core protein assemble around that pregenomic RNA. Those capsids can be recycled back to the nucleus or secreted with an envelope. And on the right here, we can see in uh, red is where the pregenomic RNA will be at. In blue is the T equals four capsid that's made up of the core that we're targeting. And yellow is the envelope that it requires as it leaves the cell. Um, and we're able to recapitulate assembly of virus capsids by working with a minimal assembly domain of the first 149 residues of HPV core protein. This assembly domain constitutively forms homodimers, and 120 of these homodimers can assemble into T equals 4 icosahedra upon addition of NACA. On the right is light scattering where we can monitor the kinetics of assembly, and we see that with higher and higher and higher concentrations of NACL, we're able to enhance the rate that we're forming capsids. And previous work in the Slotnik lab um, led to the design of a drug screen um, designed to find molecules that enhance subunit, asso subunit, subunit association energy. Um, and the reason why we would want to enhance the subunit, subunit association, is association energy instead of decreasing that um, is because one, uh, we might be able to lock in assembly defects, and two, uh, we might be able to promote the formation of empty capsids. And so that drug screen led us to this molecule right here, which we call DBT1. And um, similarly, by light scattering, we can see that as we move from one to five to 10 to 20 micromolar DBT, um, we enhance the kinetics of assembly of higher order structures in a dose dependent fashion. When we take these same samples and we inject them on a size exclusion chromatography column, we see that as we increase the concentration of our DBT1, we're making more and more capsids or higher order structures. This equates to an enhancement of the uh, delta G per contact, which is a measure of the subunit subunit association energy by about 1.3 kcals per mole. So we were interested in the effect that DBT1 was having on um, particle morphology. Um, and so I did some transmission electron microscopy. And if we just look after one day, um, we see that with no drug, we're forming normal icosahedral capsids. And as we add more and more drugs, or more and more drug, um, we're uh, disturbing assembly more and more. Um, with, par with particles that are perturbed, some with overgrowths, and some with almost uh, these sort of pinched kind of shapes. But if we look just at this, this column right here at five micromolar, um, one thing that I noticed is that the morphology of these assembly products was changing over time. So that by three days, I saw a lot of these sort of incomplete, almost conical type structures. And by a week, I was even seeing cylindrical structures. In this condition right here, I took some of this very same uh, material and I imaged it by cryo EM. And this is just showing us that these actually do exist in solution. Um, and I hope you can see it and that it's not too hard to see. But um, so anyway, um, you know, I was interested in understanding the mechanism of this changing morphology over time. We knew that by, by one day that practically all of the free subunit um, is incorporated into a higher order structure, whether it be a capsid or an aberrant structure. Um, and so I reasoned that um, formation of these kinds of structures at longer time points were driven by a dynamic rearrangement upon a preformed oligomeric scaffold, and that 
This is being driven by very, very low concentrations of free subunit. Um, and so to sort of test this hypothesis, I designed two assembly modes. Um, the first is batch assembly, um, where as previously, uh, when we just combine DBT with our core protein, um, we expect sort of ballooned morphologies with some overgrowths as well. Um, but I wanted to get at this mechanism of uh, rearrangement on an oligomeric scaffold. And so I designed another assembly mode, which we refer to as progressive assembly. Um, and that's where I just add a small amount of core protein. And here after this first addition, um, we expect to form a small number of nuclei. And then with three subsequent additions, um, I'm hope, you know, I reason that the, um, the added subunit would be built onto these uh, smaller number of nuclei um, and that we might be able to recapitulate similar morphologies in shorter time scales. Importantly, the, the concentrations of all the components that go into these two different assembly modes are the exact same. The only difference is the order of addition. And what I see with my progressive assembly is a dramatically changed, uh, or, or I see that the morphology of these particles is dramatically changed. Um, I see a, a much greater number of these conical structures and these tubular structures as well. Um, I, one thing that I, that I did notice is that with these conical structures, I was able to measure the cone angles. And after measuring enough of them, um, I realized very quickly that these were reminiscent of um, these were reminiscent of um, fullerene cones that Ganser and colleagues have seen previously with HIV capsid. Um, and the implications of this being a fullerene cone are that it's made up of a hexameric lattice, which makes me even more interested in, in examining these cylindrical structures even more. Um, and so looking at this actual particle right here um, that I have with my laser pointer on, um, I zoomed in and then the top right is the raw image and we see um, a clear signature in the FFT. And when I filter out the noise here in the power spectrum, um, I hope you can see that there's sort of an unambiguous hexameric lattice. There are striations along the length of the cylinder and there are, such, there are diagonal striations in either direction as well. And so uh, this sort of confirmed my hypothesis um, but we were also interested in understanding the effect of DBT1 on preformed capsids. Um, and so we know that uh, hepatitis B forms a T equals four capsid, which is going to have 30 um, six-fold axes of symmetry. And so, um, and we know that DBT1 binds to six-folds. And so we, um, we used a form of uh, hepatitis B core protein that forms uh, cross-links um, that make the capsid resistant to disassembly. And then we incubated these capsids with the drug. Um, and then, um, and so it was Joe Wong, who's now at Penn State, who, um, who imaged the, who made these particles and imaged them. And uh, Chris Schlixa performed localized reconstructions around the five-fold axes and, si and six-fold axes. And what we see here in C is around the five-fold axes in um, uniquely, we see density for DBT1 in, uh, in the A site. Also, when we look at the six-fold, um, we see density for DBT1 in the B site as well, which um, has not been seen in other chemotypes that have been shown to bind to hepatitis B capsids before. So this was unique. But, um, but we were also interested in whether this would be a stabilizing effect or a destabilizing effect. And so instead of working with a cross-linked version, I first just assembled capsids that are held together by uh, their normal contacts. And, <clears throat> and uh, I incubated these, I purified these capsids by size exclusion chromatography. And then I incubated them with different concentrations of DBT1. And, so, and I analyzed them by native gel electrophoresis combined with an immunoblock. And so we see that the subunit, uh, my subunit control migrates down here and my capsid control migrates up here. And as we, migra as we increase the concentration of DBT that we add, um, we end up seeing our core protein starting to co-migrate with the free subunit. When I take these very same conditions and I inject them over a size exclusion chromatography column, 
um, we see that as we keep adding more and more DBT, our core protein starts to have a later and later elution time, indicating these capsids are falling apart. So um, synthesizing all this information together, um, we uh, learn that DBT1 enhances subunit subunit interactions to promote the formation of aberrant particles. Um, and it does this by stabilizing hexameric glasses. However, while uh, DBT1 stabilizes subunit subunit interactions, um, this will cause a global strain on the capsid that will cause it to um, rupture with a high concentration of drug. And with that, I would like to thank all the people who made this work possible. I'd like to thank all the people in um, the Zlotnik lab um, and, um, and Chris Schlicksup, whose work was essential to um, seeing the density of DBT in all four sites. Um, Steve for working on the drug screen all those years ago and Joe Wong um, for uh, collecting the cryo EM data all those years ago as well. And with that, I'd like to open up to any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you too for a nice talk. Uh, I can't see any questions in the in the chat, so uh, maybe we can wait a minute. Maybe someone will encourage himself and uh, write something. Uh, otherwise, I would like to highly encourage you to write the <clears throat> the questions in the chat during the presentation because. Uh, even though there will be no time at the end, uh, the presenter can answer them afterwards in the in the chat. So please ask. And I still can't see nothing. Uh, one question: uh, Did you measure the EC fifty? Um, so this, so the EC fifty, um, uh, in terms of um, the, uh, are you, are you referencing, um, EC50 in terms of, um, the, uh, the concentration of, uh, in terms of the antiviral activity within cells or just with the purified proteins that I've been working with? Um, what we find, um, is that, uh, the DBT seems to bind very tightly, but I do not have, uh, I did not measure the EC50. Okay, thank you for the answer and uh, the other questions are waiting for you in the chat. Thank you very much. Yep, and um, it appears there's one more question. Um, and so um, what that says, how does DBT1 relate to other CPAMs such as HAPS? Um, and so DBT1, um, DBT1 binds, to a t binds to all four quasi-equivalent interfaces, whereas HAPS, um, which also bind to HBV capsids, only bind to two of four quasi-equivalent interfaces. So the in the and they bind to the B and the C sites, which are the most open of the four interfaces. Um, and so the and so um, the A site and the D site seem to be tighter, and there's not as much room to accommodate a CPAM. Um, and so DBT binds in a unique way, such that um, it is able to bend around um, the subunit that sort of rests on top of it. Um, and so it's able to fit into tighter sites. Um, so with that, I guess uh, I will stop sharing um, and turn it over. Thank you.